for the past number of weeks we've been doing a series starting a, a, doing a series on the doctrines some major doctrines of the Bible and so far we've looked at five of them and uh, first one was depravity total depravity how that men are born in sin and uh, we're just well just without without uh, until we accept the Lord as our Savior, we are depraved or in depravity and in grace. Because of grace, we can accept the Lord, and His grace is sufficient. It says, for by grace are you saved through faith. We're saved because of God's grace and Him, him caring that much for us. And I'm, aren't you glad that He cares for us? That even though we were born in sin, that He's made a way of escape, if I can say it that way, through grace that He's given to us in regeneration uh, just being made new again uh, from the old self and it, when we come to the point in time where we accept Christ as our Savior and then we're regenerated there's a, a new life that takes place within us and a, a new desire that is there and then imputation if you remember that one where Jesus took on himself our sin not only our sin, but sin for the whole world, it says, that he uh, was a propitiation for our, not only our sins, but for the sins of the whole world. He took that on himself when he hung there on a cross. What a tremendous, tremendous thought, almost uncomprehensible, that thought that he did that for us, that uh, he would be willing to come down here to earth to live and then to go to the cross and pay the price that we should pay, even though we couldn't pay that price he paid it for us so we wouldn't have to in the Old Testament they made sacri animal sacrifices and uh, that didn't take away the sin but it covered the sin up until the time when Christ came and died on the cross for us and then that took away the sin um, Jerry was talking about this in the Sunday school class about there's no con no more condom no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus what a tremendous tremendous thought that is and then last week was repentance. You know, there comes a point in time in our lives when we have to make a choice. Are we going to repent of our sin? Or are we going to continue on living in sin and continue on heading for an eternity apart from Christ? So I'm glad that he made provision for repentance. And we just mentioned too briefly, uh, Judas, you know, repented, sort of, it wasn't a genuine repentance. He was sorry for what he had done, but Peter repented, and uh, God accepted that repentance, obviously. And look at the difference. One Peter or, or Judas went out and hung himself, and Peter went on to become a tremendous evangelist. Uh, the one message that he preached, three thousand people accepted the Lord one day. <laughs> that would be three times the size of Happy Camps. Wouldn't that be? Wouldn't that be something if? if People would flock to the Lord like that. Anyhow, just with repentance that God used Peter. Today I want to look at the God's plan of redemption and just the the buying back of that. You know, it's not new, but it's something that we need to look at from time to time. Just to be reminded again, all these things are probably not new to us, uh, especially if we're here and we know Christ is our Savior. These things aren't new to us, but doesn't it do good just sometimes to take a look at them and, and renew them again and think about them? Uh, I, I I think it, it does help an awful lot. C.I. Schofield says, Redemption is the greatest theme of the Bible. Redemption is the greatest theme of the Bible. Buying back, he paid the price so that you and I could spend eternity with him and we could we could have salvation, and it's only through him. Uh, it's not because of anything we do, but it's simply because of what he's done for us that we can have, that, uh, you know, we can be redeemed back again. You know, the Old Testament gives us a type, and the New Testament gives us the anti-type. By that I mean the Old Testament, uh, if you remember about the kinsman redeemer with Ruth and Boaz do you remember that story about Ruth and Boaz and the kinsman redeemer and uh, how 
there was another person who was supposed to to be able to to uh, meet uh, Ruth and Boaz's needs, but he couldn't do it. And so, Bo uh, not Ruth and Boaz, Ruth and her mother's needs, and because he couldn't do it, Boaz was able to do that. And we know that Jesus is from that line of uh, through Ru uh, Boaz and Ruth. And so we just, just the Old Testament kinsman redeemer was the one who was able to pay that price for us. And in the New Testament, we read about a Savior who was willing and went to the cross to pay the price for our redemption. And redemption is holy of God, holy through that person, Jesus Christ, God the Son. And it was his blood that was shed to, pay, to, to buy us back again. And for that, we can be very thankful. In the Old Testament, animal sacrifices covered the sin. In the New Testament, the blood of Christ not only covered sin, but it took the sin away. So the need for redemption. Uh, obviously, we start out depraved, and we we mentioned some of those things. And and until there comes a point in, in our lives when we recognize that we're a sinner and we recognize that we need a, we need to be redeemed, and God is willing, God the Son was willing to do that. Look with me over in Romans chapter 5, verse 12. Romans chapter 5, verse 12. It says, Therefore, just as through one man sin entered the world, and death through sin, and thus, thus death spread, to all men, because all sin. For um, let me read verse thirteen as well too. It says, "For until the law, sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed when there is no law." Jesus came here to take away the sin that we have committed. You know, from time to time, or from that time forward, there's always been a need for redemption before men could be reconciled back to God. And eventually we'll talk about reconciliation, being reconciled back with God. But, you know, sin is not forced on us. We choose to sin. It's something that we don't have to do, but we choose to do that. Uh, at least after we accept Christ as our Savior, then we don't have to sin. But uh, certainly we do sin, don't we? You know, there's none of us here. In fact, the Bible tells us there's none. All of sin that comes short of the glory of God. And if we say we haven't sinned, we make God a liar. So we, even as God's children, we still sin. But I'm glad he's made provisions to take care of that for us. First John 1, 9, if you know what that says, that uh, he's faithful. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. You know, I believe probably one of the saddest days in history was when, when uh, I believe it was I believe it was Jesus. Uh, we call it a, a, a theophany in the Old Testament when Adam and Eve were in the garden. Do you remember that when they were in the garden and Jesus and they had sinned, and Jesus came and and had to. He says, "Adam, where are you?" And Adam was hiding because he knew he had sinned. You know what a what a sad sad situation, and you know I think I think it must have broke the heart of God when he had when that happened that Adam sinned even though he wasn't he wasn't supposed to and Adam knew he wasn't supposed to but yet he still went ahead and did it anyhow and you know, I believe God's heart was broken and the same is true for us too when we sin you know I believe God's heart's broken when we just go along our merry old way and do our, our thing, whatever we want to do, and, and not pay attention to him. And I believe that breaks God's heart as well, too. Because of Adam's sin, we're in need of being redeemed. But because of God's great loving plan of redemption, we can be saved. And the choice is up to us. We can either accept the work that he did for us there on the cross, or else we can reject that. You know, it's really sad, isn't it? There's so many people reject that work that he did for them, for us on the cross. What a sad, sad situation that is. Do you think it's wise, 
a wise choice to reject God's gift of salvation? Uh, I think that's kind of a dumb question, isn't it, really, to even ask that question. But, you know, to to reject what he's done for us. And can, can you just imagine spending eternity in hell apart from God and just all that goes along with that? I, I've been thinking considerably about that lately because we have family and friends that fall into that category. And uh, what a what a sad situation. And they don't even realize they're headed in that direction. And yet, uh, well, I'm thankful that God has made provision for me to be redeemed, and I've accepted that provision. The need of redemption. We all need to be redeemed. And the cost of redemption. You know, there's only one and only one thing that could redeem fallen, sinful uh, mankind, and that was the blood of Christ. That was what the requirement was. Uh, God chose that way, and that's the way it is. And the cost was the precious blood of Jesus, the highest price that could ever be paid. And we see that again in in, uh, in, in 1 Peter chapter 1. Diana read these verses for us this morning with 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 18 and 19. It says, Knowing that you were not redeemed with corruptible things like silver or gold from your aimless conduct received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb, without blemish and without spot. Hadn't sinned. And yet this is what we were talking about when we talked about the imputation, how he took our sin on him, a person who never had sinned uh, ever and was without sin, and yet he took our sin on him. What a, well, I, don't, I don't even know how to describe it. What a, what a time in history that must have been when he did that. But it was a blood from a pure, unblemished lamb. J. Dwight Pentecost says, Silver and gold are corruptible and are corrupted because they are under the curse. You know, we sing that song, What Can Wash Away My Sin? The obvious answer, nothing but the blood of Jesus. That's the only thing that can wash away our sin. Apart from that, uh, we we can't have our sins. There's nothing we can do. doesn't matter how good we are or what we try to do or what we try to say or think. Uh, we can't have our sins washed away based upon works. You know, isn't it sad that there's so many people that are trying that? That they want to go to heaven based on their works. And we know according to Scripture that simply is not going to happen. The deliverance through redemption. We not only have redemption, we're not only redeemed, but we can have deliverance through that redemption as well. And having purchased us by his blood, we're free from sin and its power. You know, if you read Romans 6, 7, and 8, it goes into great detail about that. Well, let's just take a quick look at Romans 6. Romans chapter 6, verses 1 through 7. And that will give us a, just an inkling of this, uh, what we're talking about here. Romans chapter 6, verses 1 through 7. It says, What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Certainly not. How shall we who died to sin live any longer in it? Or do you not know that as many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ, were baptized, uh, Christ Jesus were baptized into his death. Therefore we are buried with him through baptism un into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. For if we have been united together in likeness, for we have been, uh, for if we have been united together in the likeness of his death, Certainly we also shall be in the likeness of his resurrection, knowing this, that, your, that our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves of sin, for he who has died has been free, has, for he who has died has been freed from sin. We don't have to sin. And the rest of the 6, 7, and 8 chapters there, uh, if you read through those, you can see that uh, just the tremendous work that Jesus did for us there on the cross and the fact that it took care of everything that we needed. Christ 
became our curse. Our curse. Galatians chapter 3, verse 13 says, Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us. Colossians 1, 13 and 14 says, He has delivered us from the power of darkness and translated us into the kingdom of the Son of his love, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. You know, like it or not, if we haven't experienced deliverance through redemption, we're still a servant of Satan. You know, either we're, we're a servant of God or we're a servant of Satan, one or the other. You can't kind of halfway be between uh, either one of them. It's either or situation. You know, it's interesting that men down through, through the centuries have tried to come up with some other means of buying our redemption but you know what? It's simply not going to work. There's one and only one way that we can be redeemed. And again, that's through the work that Christ, God the Son, did for us there on the cross. <clears throat> the scope of redemption. And first of all, when, when did God come up with the plan of redemption? I believe it was long before Adam was ever sinned in the garden. His plan of redemption originated before the foundations of the world were ever formed. Look with me in Ephesians chapter 4, chapter 1, verses 4 through 7. Ephesians chapter 4, verses 1 through 7. Ephesians chapter 1, verses 4 through 7. I'll get it right yet. Just hang in there with me. I'm working at it. Anyhow, Ephesians 1, 4 through 7 says, just as he chose us in him uh, before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestined us uh, to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to him, to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, by which he made us uh, accepted in the beloved. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of his grace. We have redemption uh, because of what he did for us there through his blood, because of what he did for us there on the cross. How far reaching is redemption? You know, I'm convinced that every man, boy, uh, girl, woman, has a capability of accepting Christ if they choose to do so. Roman, or Revelation chapter Five, verse 9, Revelation chapter 5, verse 9. Revelation 5, verse 9 says, and this is, this is neat, I think. And they sang a new song saying, You are worthy to take the scroll and to open uh, its seals, for you were slain and have redeemed us to God by your blood. Out of every tribe and tongue and people and nation, and having made us uh, made us kings and priests to our God, we shall reign uh, on the earth. Every tribe, tongue, nation, people from all over the whole globe are going to be in heaven. Isn't that going to be neat? You know, and we won't have to worry about different languages because we'll all speak one language. But imagine people who have accepted the Lord, let's say, in Ethiopia or Africa. Well, Africa and Ethiopia would be pretty close to the same, wouldn't it? But China and some of these different countries, you know, these different people all be there around the throne of God and, and spending eternity together in heaven. Some from every tribe and nation. What a tremendous, tremendous thought that is. The problem is, will we be there? Will you be there? Will I be there? I know I'll be there. Will you be there? And your family members? You know, that's uh, something to think about, isn't it? Like I mentioned, we have unsaved family members and friends, and I'm sure you have unsaved family members and friends as well, too, that unless they accept the work that Christ did, God the Son did for us there on the cross, uh, they're not going to be there, as sad as that is. And what a horrible, horrible thought that that is from that perspective. But by a simple act of faith and trusting in what God did for us on the cross, uh, we can be part of his heavenly 
citizenship, if you want to say it that way. And I can't help but think of that song that says, when we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that's going to be. Just imagine. Uh, I, I can't even begin to imagine it, but, uh, you know, I kind of have some thoughts and whatever, but you can probably begin to imagine a little bit as well, too. Well, what a day of rejoicing that's going to be when people from the beginning of time, from around the globe, they're in heaven worshiping and, and enjoying that time together for all eternity with him, the scope of redemption, not just Jews. Aren't you glad that he came to not just die for the Jews, but he came to die for Gentiles as well, too? That's us. And if he had not included us, we wouldn't be in heaven. So I'm glad that the scope of redemption is not just for Jews only, but for any Jew or Gentile that will accept him. And the length of redemption. You know, it's a redemption is a once-for-all eternal thing. John chapter 10, verses 28 through 30. John chapter 10, verses 28 through 30. It says, And I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of my, hand, out of my Father's hand. I and my Father are one. You know, once we're there, we're there. And nobody's going to be able to take it take that away from or take us away from him. He died for us and he's not going to renege on his on his promise that he is going to save us. And I believe that once a person is saved he is he or she is always saved and you don't lose your salvation based on what happens. You don't earn your salvation by works. You don't lose your salvation by works. And it's a it's an ongoing eternal uh thing that we have ahead, ahead for us. Once we've been purchased uh, from slavery to sin, we'll never be resold back into slavery again. God becomes our master and uh, we serve him, not Satan. At least that's the way it should be. You know. And when we sin, who are we serving? You know, when we sin, we're not serving God, are we? But we're serving Satan. And that's a sad situation when it happens. You know, the uh, Pentecost again says, Christ is emphasizing the security which belongs to the child of God because he has been purchased by the Father to be given as a love gift to the Son. And the writer of the Hebrews also supports this truth when he says, Therefore, he, talking about God the Son, is also able to save to the uttermost those who come to God through him, since he ever lives to make intercession for them. That's in Hebrews chapter 7, verse 25. You know, the word uttermost, to me, I believe is, in my opinion, in my mind anyhow, is, is eternal. The context, in this context, to me, uh, says that it's an eternal thing. It's not just a temporary thing for a few years, but rather it's an eternal uh Redemption, the destiny of redemption, uh, the destiny of the redeemed, I mean to say. A multitude of scriptures clearly point to the redeemed's destiny as in heaven. To me, one of the strongest arguments that the redeemed will be saved and will be in heaven is in John 14, 1 through 3, where it says, uh, Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go and prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I'll come again and receive you unto myself. Wherever the redeemed spend eternity, there's one thing for sure. The Godhead will be there with us. Isn't that neat? That we'll have the Godhead there with us for all eternity. First uh, Thessalonians 4, 17 says, then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and thus we shall always be with the Lord. Is that encouraging? You know, to me it's encouraging to know that 
I have that to look forward to, and if you are saved, you have that to look forward to, and it's not just a, a, a part-time thing or for a little length of time, but for all eternity. Uh, it encourages me to know that we'll spend eternity with him. So to me, what makes the whole plan of salvation as exciting is that one day we'll see Jesus face to face and spend eternity with him and all the other ones who have believed in him down through the centuries. Uh, can you imagine spending eternity with or being in the presence of uh, these great apostles that we have in the Old Testament uh, prophets and just different ones? What a What an encouragement to be able to sit and listen to, well, well, let's just say Paul, the Apostle Paul, to sit and listen to him. I don't know if he's going to teach or not or whatever, but to to be there and, and just see him, you know. And, of course, first and foremost is going to be to see the Lord, uh, the God, and uh, what a tremendous thing that's going to be. Well, like, again, when we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that's going to mean. You know, Job in the Old Testament stated the following without reservation. For I know that my Redeemer lives, and he shall stand at last on the earth. After my skin is destroyed, this I know, that in my flesh I shall see God. Now we're going to get a different body. It's going to be, it's going to be this body reju rejuvenated. Is that a word I can use? Uh, made, made new. Uh, the mortal body is going to put on immortality. But if I understand scripture correctly, we'll be able to recognize each other. Uh, we won't be uh, unrecognizable when we get there. And only the redeemed can say that I know that I'll see my redeemer. Uh, William Evans says, there can be no gospel story message or preaching without the story of the death of Christ, the redeemer of men. That's what it's all about, is the fact that he died for us and in doing so, paid the price for us that we couldn't pay. We sang that song, Jesus paid it all. Let me just go over verses three and four again. He paid the ultimate price. It says, for nothing good have I whereby thy grace to claim. I'll wash my garments white in the blood of Calvary's lamb. And in the chorus is, Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain, he washed it, white as snow and then verse 4 says and when before the throne i stand in him complete jesus died my soul to save my lips shall still repeat jesus paid it all all to him i owe sin left a crimson stain and he washed it whiter than snow and that's what we're looking at here this morning when we have communion just the fact that he came down here and did what he did and then went to the cross so you and i might have life and not just only have life, but have life more abundant. Wow. And, you know, this is only just a reminder, but uh, I hope it does remind us of what he did for us there on the cross. Uh, took sin, our sin, on him who knew no sin, that we might be, uh, that he might be made sin for us and that we might have everlasting life. If this doesn't cause our heart to rejoice, I don't know what will. The joy of redemption, just because of who he is and what he's done for us, ought to cause great joy in our hearts. So the guys come forward, let's go ahead and